Hi, everybody. It's Kevin Raber, and uh, we're back with another Photo PXL Photo Chats. And uh, happy to be here today. We're going to have a great program. And uh, it's been quite the week with all sorts of things happening. But I'll tell you what I found was that the uh, eclipse was one of those special moments that I didn't know was going to happen the way it happened. It was, it gave me goosebumps and good feelings. And uh, I'll show you a couple of clips pictures in just a second. Um, to uh, it was just an amazing experience. Uh, I think a lot of this country was looking at the same spot at the same time and forgetting everything mm -hmm. else, and uh, it was pretty cool. But anyway, um, want to uh, start with the calendar of upcoming events. Uh, today we have Ian Plant. We'll do an introduction for Ian in just a, a few minutes. Our next photo chat will feature Dan Steinhardt. Uh, Dano, as we all know him from Epson, uh, a great guy, funny guy, and while he does a great job as an advocate for all of us in the printing side of things for Epson, he's also a damn good photographer. Um, he'll tell the story how Jeff kind of made him switch gears, um, but uh, that would be entertaining. We uh, have a couple pending um, people that I'm working with for the May events, and so you'll see that we're skipping May just because I don't have anybody firmed up, but probably will be in the next couple of days. Um, June 5th, we start off with Hugh Brownstone. Hugh uh, has a YouTube channel called uh, Three Blind Men and, a, and an Elephant, and he's got a really distinctive style, and uh, he's really well known for his street photography. Uh, he and his wife uh, do do that together, and they teach uh, workshops on street photography. Um, I've known Hugh because we bump into each other at the press junkets and so forth. Um, so I think you'll enjoy Hugh's presentation. We're going to start that uh, episode of a little bit early. We're going to start at 1.30 just because he's got some scheduling conflicts and doesn't want to have any issues uh, with that. So we'll be doing that uh, on June 5th with Hugh. On uh, June 19th, uh, we've got Alan Ross, and uh, I'm going to be doing a workshop. So uh, while I'm doing that workshop, and even though I'm going to try to sign on, uh, Holger is going to be hosting Alan's event, and uh, you'll see more information about Alan, great uh, photographer specializing in black and white. And then uh, Suzanne Mathias is uh, July 17th. Uh, we have uh, July 3rd. I'm working on somebody for that date too. So we'll fill in the calendars and keep you posted. But just keep marking every other Wednesday at 2 o'clock uh, for these photo chats and uh, we'll be in line with things. First off, I also want to thank Jeff Shiwi. Uh, Jeff's um, a great guy, funny guy, and um, he's just had a great adventure. Maybe he's going to do a whole program on his adventure to the West Coast, um, and I'm going to talk to him about that. So before Warren, Jeff, we'll talk in the next day or so. Uh, obviously, uh, myself, but the originator of uh, this whole concept is John Cornicello. If you don't know John, an amazing photographer, and he was doing this twice a week for you know, almost a year or so uh, during the pandemic. And I don't know how he did it, but uh, he did an amazing job. And we've got Holger. Holger comes to us from uh, Germany. Um, he handles and does a lot of the graphics that we have and we, we use and uh, uh, amazing photographer also, so we check out his website and things. Um, a couple of workshops that are coming up. We still have one, one opening left in the Faroe Islands workshop if you want to do a last minute workshop. I have one spot left in my second Palouse workshop uh, in June. We only have five people in each of those workshops. So it's very intimate. We go around in, in one car, uh, have a great time photographing places. We're nonstop from sun up to sundown every single day. We cover hundreds of miles. There's so much to photograph out there. Just an amazing, amazing landscape. It's the Tuscany of America. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, I know all the spots to go. I've been doing that since 2004. Uh, so I've got a lot of good relationships. I've done it a couple of times with Jeff. Uh, although he's a bad luck charm for me, I always get a flat tire or something with Jeff. Always an adventure with Jeff on board. Um, I've got one cabin left in my Greenland workshop in, in August. Uh, we are visiting a new fjord system because the Scoresbury Sound, uh, the good country of Greenland, decided to put restrictions on tourism there. So uh, we've moved to a different fjord system and it looks even cooler. So uh, we expect big ice, big glaciers. Uh, a number of really good landings compared to what we could do in Scoresbury. So uh, if we have, if you're interested in, in a remarkable trip, then uh, take a look at the uh, Greenland trip on our rockhopperworkshops.com. Uh, and then I've got a fine art printing workshop 
in uh, the end of May and also one in October. So uh, if you really want to get down to making prints and learning how to do that, uh, that's the place to go. Jeff does those with me and John Panazzo, and uh, we end up having a great time together for Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday, making prints, framing, learning all the things about uh, fine art printing. We have five printers in my studio now with two computers driving those. Uh, we have the new 5370 from Epson. We have serial number 12 on that one, so we are very, very fortunate to get one of the very first ones. And uh, on PhotoPXL now, we do have a review of that printer done by Mark Siegel, very extensive review. Uh, I'll have a video um, setting up that printer uh, in the next few days, hopefully. And we're also going to have an article uh, that I'm breaking out of the uh 5370 article from mark on the epson print layout and also the epson media installer which allows you to uh, put third party uh, paper surfaces and profiles into uh, the epson print layout uh, type software so that you can print with any different paper you want um, so we'll be doing stuff like that um, in a few minutes when we start the program we'll be muting everybody beforehand uh, so, uh, Ian, you're going to have to unmute yourself, most likely. Um, please ask questions in the chat, as uh, we've done in the past. John will be watching those, and he'll bring them up at the appropriate time or bring them up at the very end when we have that. Um, if we do have an opportunity at the end, you can unmute your microphones and ask questions. And then we'll just stay online after we stop the recording for a few minutes of socializing, and uh, we'll go from there. Uh, this is uh, I'm going to show you two of my eclipse pictures there was you know like eclipse you just can't go out and practice you know you gotta just either read and, and learn what to do i bought this silly 90 dollar filter to go on my 200 mm -hmm. to 600 millimeter zoom lens um it's for sale if anybody wants one now i'm happy to sell that to you if, if you'd like um and uh, it's just really amazing the detail i shot this on the a7r4 so i had 60 some odd megapixels and i mean you can see the the flares and the, the solar explosions on these uh, was really cool. There's that one moment where you get that thing called the, you know, I think they call it the diamond and stuff. And of course, there's Bailey beads and all sorts of technology and words and stuff there that you can use. Anyway, it was quite the experience. I do have a whole sequence. I don't know if I'll composite or do something. You know, it could be, I could get clever if I want, but I don't know. It's kind of, the eclipse is over and it's, it's kind of behind me now, but it was quite the experience to be able to photograph it. So I'm happy that. I got some good pictures. One of the other things that I do, if uh, anybody from the Indianapolis area is watching this, on April 25th, four times a year, uh, I uh, host uh, an Indie Captures event at the Indianapolis Art Center. I'm an artist in residence there. That's where I've got all my gear, and I'm quite fortunate to be part of that uh, organization. It's a really good organization, amazing facility, lots of cool things happening there, great spirit. And uh, when I had to move out of my other gallery and studio, I was fortunate to get invited to come to the Indianapolis Art Center. And uh, I, I'm, I'm loving it. And as Jeff will attest, because he's been there, I've got a beautiful big studio. And uh, it's a great place to learn, teach, and do all sorts of cool stuff. So if anybody from Indies in the area, in October or on April 25th, October, where am I? At 6 p.m., we have two great, talented, uh, uh, women giving a presentation. They're both journalists, uh, photojournalists, and they got some amazing images to share. So we'll be doing that on April 25th. Today's guest is Ian Plant. I've, I've known Ian for a long time, or I should say I've known of Ian for a long time. And uh, we both were part of the instructor uh, team for uh, Mensch workshops in Antarctica back in December together. And uh, had a lot of fun on the trip, and I got to know Ian. and. Uh, I've watched one or two of his presentations, and they were just amazing. Uh, so I thought it would be appropriate to invite Ian here. He's, do he's doing some pretty cool stuff. He's got some great programs. I'm sure he'll share some of the stuff that he does as far as uh, his videos and teaching and, and things. And uh, he's, he's just a lot of fun. And he's got a, uh, some great videos out there. So um, Ian, I want to say welcome to the, the group. And uh with that i'm going to unshare my screen and you can turn your screen on and go to town my friend all right fantastic thank you so much kevin wait. i had a great i just got to mute everybody hold on one second okay oh. please wait 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 mute all and then you have to unmute yourself ian here we go um i think i'm still unmuted can you hear me uh just hold on there we go 
Okay, okay go ahead. All right. Well, thank you, Kevin, for that warm introduction. And thank you all for coming to see me today. And uh, Kevin, I also had a great time with you in Antarctica. Uh, certainly, we had more fun hanging out on the uh, the bridge, uh, having drinks than we did when we were out in the cold <laughs> with the penguins. <laughs> yeah, the, the old milkman story. We had a lot of fun. It was pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I had forgotten about that. <laughs> uh, private joke, everyone. Sorry. Yeah, Maybe well, if, uh, if you get a few drinks in Kevin, he might tell you the story. Uh, or maybe I'll just uh, yeah, word it out towards to... the end of the presentation today. <laughs> well, today I am going to talk about one of my favorite topics, and that is visual design and photography. And I'm going to go ahead and share my screen because no one wants to see me. They're going to want to see the photographs instead. I've been told I have a face for radio. Uh, unfortunately, I have a voice for blogging, so you guys are just going to have to suffer through one or both of those things. Uh, but I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and switch over to my presentation and go full screen. Everything look good on your end? All right, perfect. Okay, so I'm going to be talking about visual design and just a little bit about myself. I've been a professional photographer full time for about 20 years now. And I love traveling to find the most amazing subjects to capture with my camera to share with others. Uh, definitely feel free to ask any questions to put them in the chat. And uh, Kevin or someone else may be monitoring those questions. If they're relevant, feel free to interrupt and ask them to me. Otherwise, we'll do a Q&A at the end. And you can learn more about me and learn more from me on my photo education platform, photomasters.com. I just sent around a link to my free photography webinar that's in the chat. So you can check that out. If after an hour of being with me today isn't enough, you can go and get some more. And you can also visit my personal website, ianplant.com to see my image portfolio. The lessons I'm gonna be talking about today about photo composition are drawn from my ebook, Visual Flow, and my ultimate photography composition course, which is a bundle of that ebook and a bunch of videos that talk about composition. And so just stepping back, what we're trying to do when we're making a visual design is we're trying to create an extraordinary photograph. We're, we're trying to translate the experience we're having as a photographer and sharing it with the viewer. And so, you know, when you take a photograph, you're not capturing reality as people experience it. We're translating that reality through the photographic process. And we need to figure out ways to make that translation successful so that the viewer can share in that experience. And I think an extraordinary photograph, first and foremost, has to go past making a mere documentary record. You know, if you're just pointing your camera at things and taking snapshots, you're not going to be making that effective translation. To make that translation, you need to impose your own artistic vision on the scene or subject that you're photographing. And ultimately, what you're trying to do is to make photos that tell viewers as much about you as an artist as about the scene or the subject that you're photographing. And so that leads us to the question of what is composition? What is visual design? What exactly are we talking about? I think most people have an intuitive sense about this. And at its most basic level, a composition is just the visual structure that you impose upon this artistic expression that you're creating. You know, basically it's where objects are placed within the image frame. It's a choice you make about what gets included, what gets excluded from the image frame. You can change your focal length to change your framing. You can change your camera angle. You can you can move around and change your position. All these things are gonna have an impact on the way objects are arranged within the scene and which objects are included within the final photograph and which fall outside of the image frame. But I think more than just that, a good composition should also tell a story about the subject, because your goal is to entice viewers, not only visually, you're, you're trying to trigger that visceral visual reaction with a good composition, but you'd also like to trigger an emotional reaction. So a good composition does more than just cleverly arrange the objects within the image space. It, it creates that vicarious connection with the viewer. But ultimately what you're doing is you're inviting viewers to see the world through your eyes. You're sharing your artistic vision. You're translating that vision, that experience that you had for them so that they can be a part of it. And with anything in photography, 
Chances are Ansel Adams said it first, and he said it in eight words or less. So all of the words that I just threw at you, I think can be summed up by this quote by Ansel Adams. You don't take a photograph, you make it. You're not just pointing your camera at something that looks cool and snapping a shot. You are actively engaged in the creative process and you are imposing your own vision on the scene or subject that is being photographed. You're making a photograph. You're not just capturing something in front of you. And I think that's the key distinction. Every time I'm out doing photography, I'm always thinking actively about what I can do to make that photograph that I'm taking my very own unique artistic expression. And so to start off with, if you are going to master the art of composition, you've got to learn to think like an artist. You have to learn this process that I call artistic abstraction. And so Minor White, another famous photographer, he had some interesting things to say as well. And he's got a quote that I've always found to be amusing, but also insightful. And that quote is, one should not only photograph things for what they are, but for what else they are. And when I first read this quote, I was like, what the heck is he talking about? Or more to the point, what is he smoking and where can I get some myself? Uh, but, but you know, it sounds like the kind of mumbo jumbo that people make up when they're trying to explain art, but don't really know what to say about it. But I actually think this is a very insightful quote. And what he's getting at here, photographing things for what else they are, is this idea of artistic abstraction. It's learning to see the visual elements in your scene in these abstract artistic terms. So instead of seeing a mountain, you see a triangle. Or instead of seeing a bear, you see a brown color. Or, you know, there's all different ways you can think of these objects or subjects in these abstract terms, in terms of shape, in terms of color, in terms of their luminosity value, how bright or how dark they are. Uh, where they are positioned within the image frame, you know, thinking about the space that the object occupies. All of these are artistic abstractions, and artists use these abstract elements all the time when they're creating their art. And it's the single most important thing you can do to improve your artistic skills, and it allows you to see creative possibilities that you would otherwise miss. And so this photo here from the Oregon coast is a good example. And I was walking on the beach, I was drawn there to the beautiful coastal scenery. But in this wide angle landscape composition, the coastal scenery is just kind of pushed to the background. It's really not the most important part of the image design. The most important part arguably is the seaweed in the foreground. And this is the sort of thing that most people might just step over. They would see some ugly seaweed. But what I saw was this beautiful curving shape. And I saw this relative brightness of luminosity. The seaweed was wet and the water on the seaweed was very reflective. So it was making the seaweed stand out from its surroundings. And so the combination of those two things worked to create and enhance this beautiful, elegant curving shape. And I used that as my foreground and I built the composition around that, but I was only able to see that as a potential part of my composition because I was thinking in the abstract, thinking like an artist. And so you should be always looking at everything, sort of, I call it deconstructing the subjects in your scene. You know, you, instead of seeing the mountain, you see the triangle. Uh, instead of seeing a truck, you see a bunch of circles and lines and triangles, all those constituent parts that make up that final object. So you should be thinking of the shape, the lines that are created, the space, the color, the luminosity value. And once you start seeing these different abstract elements, you can start figuring out a way to put them together to make a compelling visual design. And one thing that I think you, everyone needs to internalize during this process is to remember that you don't really need an extraordinary subject to make a compelling composition. Uh, you know, you don't need to go out and find the biggest tallest, gnarliest looking mountain, uh, or the most gorgeous Italian supermodel when you're making photographs. You can make great photographs from everyday subjects or things that people might consider to be mundane or ugly. If you think of the work of famous street photographer Henri Cartier-Bresson, 
he didn't go out looking for the most attractive Parisians. He just wandered the streets looking for these random convergences of shadow and light and shape and form. And he was just taking pictures of the everyday and they were great art. And so I don't even think of my subject as being my subject. My subject is just one visual component within the overall final composition. And so if I'm photographing a penguin in Antarctica, I'm not thinking about, hey, I'm photographing a penguin. I'm thinking about how that subject works within the entire composition that I'm creating. So there's a shape created by the penguin and I need to balance that somewhere else by something that I bring into the composition to make it more interesting. And so you don't have a subject, you've just got visual elements that work together to create a successful composition. And when you learn to, to see in the abstract, it's, it's kind of like looking at abstract art. Um, abstract art really is doing this process of visual deconstruction. When you look at abstract art, there aren't any defined forms or subjects. It's just usually a bunch of blurry shapes and colors. It's taking everything and sort of looking at the world with squinted eyes so that everything just gets kind of fuzzy and indistinct. It's boiling everything down to essential shapes and patterns and colors. And so learning how to do abstract photographs is a great way of practicing thinking in the abstract. Uh, but you don't need to make abstract photos to do this. You can think in the abstract even when you're working with photorealistic subjects. And so here's a series of photos that I took in the past year. It's a project I've been working on flying over salt marshes in the Eastern United States and other places around the world with my drone. And if you've been to a salt marsh, salt marshes are not very exciting. They're actually quite boring. They're flat. They've got nothing interesting going on. Uh, if you're a wildlife shooter, there might be some interesting birds in the salt marshes. But as a landscape subject, it's, it's really not all that interesting. But from the air and looking for all these abstract visual elements, all of a sudden, all these beautiful shapes and colors and patterns emerge. And so this is a subject that most people, landscape photographers, traditionally have avoided because it's completely uninteresting. But thinking like an artist, looking for those abstract visual qualities, I found that the salt marshes were actually beautifully photogenic. And so this is a project that I'm still working on today because I'm just fascinated by it. And even when I'm working with more photorealistic subjects, I'm still thinking about this visual abstraction. And sometimes I'll push my photographs into a more abstract quality, like this photograph here of an infant orangutan clinging to its mother. And I waited for the moment where the orangutan buried her head into her mother's fur. And I was drawn to this abstract scene because of the shape formed by the infant's body and arm, this S-curve shape that became the basis of my composition. So this is a photorealistic subject that's rendered in a quasi-abstract way. It becomes a study of shape and of color. And so I will inject these abstract qualities into my compositions whenever I can. But usually I'm producing something that's less abstract and more what I call photorealistic. And so I've, I've mentioned the word shapes several times now. Shapes are the most essential building blocks of successful compositions. And in one sense, composition is all about seeing the shapes that are out there and finding a way to get them to play nicely within your composition, to arrange them in a way that is effective and that leads the viewer's eye. And I'm always thinking about the shapes that are created by objects. I'm, I'm looking for simple graphic shapes curves, circles, spirals, triangles, diamonds, lines, these very essential shapes that you learn when you're a small child and you're in preschool and you're playing with wooden blocks and you're trying to find the block that goes into the correct hole. So you get the triangle block and you stick it in the triangle hole. And that's how you learn shapes as a kid. Well, those basic shapes are really what you're playing with as an artist. And so when I talk about shape, I don't mean the literal shape of an object. I'm, I'm meaning these deconstructed simple shapes. So this is a photograph I took of a polar bear in Alaska, and it was backlit on a very bright sunny day by the setting sun. And I chose a dark exposure intentionally, letting 
most of the bear and the scene behind it fall into deep silhouette. And I just set my exposure to capture the highlights of the, the fringe lighting on the fur of the animal. And so that reveals a shape that is recognizable to most people as a bear shape. But I'm not talking about that kind of shape. What you really need to do is deconstruct that bear shape and think about all of the other shapes that are created here. So for example, you've got triangle, which is the shape of the head. And then you've got lines that are formed by the legs. And there's even the curve of the back of the animal. So there's all of these constituent shapes that make up that overall bear silhouette. And I'm always thinking about those simpler shapes. And now the cool thing about photography is that your position relative to an object can change its shape. You can manipulate the shape of an object. And so on a very basic level, as you move around an object, you might find that the apparent shape changes. And so these three photographs are of the same butte in Utah. This is a big butte that rises out of the Utah desert. And this is what it looks like from one angle. And from a, another angle, the shape completely changes. This becomes more of a rectangle, like a shoebox. And then from a different angle, it looks like the Space Needle in Seattle. And so just at a very basic level, as you move around an object, you might see its shape changing, but you can also manipulate the shape of an object by getting closer or farther away, higher or lower, moving left or right. As you change your relative position, you can change the way the shapes look and you can use that to your advantage. And so I like making photos uh, using these graphic shapes. Sometimes the graphic shapes become the overall compositional structure. So this is a photo I made in the Komodo Islands of Indonesia using my drone looking straight down at this one small island. And it's really a study of the colors, but also of the shapes. And it was two shapes that were working together. There is the circle of the reef around the island and then the triangle of the island itself. So these two shapes are playing together in the composition and they're the basis of the composition. And here's another example from Greenland. Uh, this is an iceberg. I took this photo with my drone, launching the drone from the motorboat I was on, uh, which is a bit of a tricky <laughs> proposition because uh, you have to launch and land from your hand on this small boat. And uh, I won't say that my face escaped unscathed from the process. I did have uh, a uh, time when my drone hit my face and cut me up pretty bad, uh, which is why I look so ugly today. I used to be very handsome. Um, in any event, I, was, I flew my drone around this iceberg to try to reveal the most dynamic compositional shape. And so I, I went with this angle because I liked this diamond shape created by the lines of the iceberg. And so you've got the line starting in the bottom middle, one moving left, one moving right, but then those lines more or less reconverge. And a lot of times when you're, when you're looking at shapes with objects, a lot of ob objects don't perfectly fit within a simple shape. Uh, so sometimes you just gotta squint a little bit and sort of imagine the closest shape uh, so this isn't quite a diamond, but it's pretty close to that diamond shape, close enough. And so that was what I chose for my composition. I liked that diamond shape because the lines coming from the lower middle, the one going left and the one going right, those are diverging the viewer's attention. They're getting the viewer's eye moving left and right. And then when those lines reconverge later, that's bringing the eye back into that central part of the composition. So it's creating a balanced composition, but it's also energetic because you've got these lines moving in different directions. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later on. And this is a shot I made in the Gobi Desert of Mongolia. And I was flying my drone. I was there in winter and I had this frozen river. So I flew up and down the river until I found this part that had this maximum curviness because I really wanted to have that dynamic zigzagging curvy shape to lead the eye from foreground to background. And that shape leads the eye to the point of interest in the background, which is the sun star rising above the cloud. But there's other prominent shapes in this composition. You've got a lot of lines formed by the, the line of sand dunes in the background, the mountains in the background, and the clouds themselves are all creating these diagonal lines that are pushing from the right side of the composition over to that rising sun, that point of interest. So the curve and all those lines are working together 
to push the viewer's eye to a very specific part of the visual design. And so a lot of these examples, the shapes have been very bold and have been a prominent part of the composition. Uh, sometimes the shapes take a more subtle role in my compositions, but I'm always thinking about the shapes, no matter what type of subject I'm photographing. So when I'm doing wildlife, I'm thinking of the shapes. I'm thinking of making these more complex compositions, bringing in other shapes to work with my main subject. And so I was trekking in Indonesia. I was looking for orangutans and I stopped to take a break. And this Thomas's leaf monkey came down from a nearby tree and sat down right next to me. It was a really rare, thrilling close encounter. And so I was close enough that I put a wide angle lens on. Actually, I chose a, a fisheye lens on purpose because I was really attracted to the curving shape of the vine that the monkey was sitting on. That was a really strong shape. And I wanted to emphasize and repeat and mirror that shape. So the fisheye lens, which doesn't correct for wide angle barrel distortion, makes straight lines look curvy. So I knew that that extra curviness would enhance that vine, but it would also curve the trees that were away from the center of the composition. So you've got this curve coming in on the other side of the composition. And these two curves working together kind of create this spiral of visual interest for this composition. So the eye starts with the vine and swings around, comes down the curve on the other side, back to the beginning. Now, there are other shapes in this composition that are important as well. Uh, the tree that the monkey is sitting on creates a triangle. Uh, and those converging diagonal lines help pull the eye from the foreground to the background of the composition, to the top of the composition. The monkey's tail creates a leading line. Uh, even the monkey's legs and arms create leading lines. And the monkey's line of sight is not a real line, it's implied, but that is actually creating a line as well. So you've got the tail bringing in the, the eye in from the lower right, and then it's hitting that vine and swinging around and then coming down the other side on that curving tree trunk. And you get back to the monkey's face and that line of sight is looking to the lower right. That's pushing the viewer back to the beginning, to the starting point of the composition, starting that process all over again. And this is a photograph I took on the south shore of Lake Superior in the winter. There's a bunch of uh, sandstone caves and cliffs that freeze over and they become these really exciting ice caves and I love getting into them and, and making photos. And for this photo, I crawled into the back of the cave and there was some ice shards that were stacked up at the back of the cave. And I intentionally chose a position so that the shape created by that pile of ice shards became a curve. So, you know, if I moved one way or the other, I lost that curving shape. So I selected a position where I was able to manipulate the shape of those objects into this dynamic curve that helps lead the viewer from foreground to the background. And of course, there's a bunch of other lines that are formed by the striations in the sandstone cave. And so these diagonal lines are pushing in from the edges and the corners, and they are all pushing the viewer to that central part of the composition. So all those shapes are working together. And here is a shot taken from one of my favorite places in the world to do landscape photography, Badlands National Park in South Dakota. Every year I do landscape masterclass workshops in the Badlands. It's a lot of fun. And I like to go there during the summer months because not only do you have the, the beautiful landscape, all of the colorful patterned claystone, but you also get these really dramatic storms that build up in the summer over the Great Plains. And Badlands National Park becomes like a storm bowling alley. You just hang out there and storms will eventually hit you. And that leads to some incredibly stunning sunset and sunrise skies. And so the combination of, you know, great light and color in the sky and these really intricate patterns and colors in the landscape down below is, is, is like being a kid in a candy store for a landscape photographer. So I love teaching landscape in this location. And here I had this really bold curve formed by the layer of white claystone that had been revealed by erosion. And um, I wanted to have a shape that would complement that shape, that would mirror it. And so when the rainbow appeared overhead, 
at sunset. That was the perfect shape I needed to bring it all together. So you've got the curve of the clay stone, and then that curve is mirrored by the curve of the rainbow. And of course, the cloud also has a another curving shape coming in. There's more shapes working together, but it's really those two shapes that are mirroring each other, that complement each other, that get the eye moving and flowing within this composition. And sometimes uh, objects can work together to create a, a shape. And so this was taken on the very famous Abraham Blank in the Canadian Rockies. It's famous because in the winter, uh, methane gas gets trapped in the ice, creating these beautiful bubbles and uh, can be really dramatic. And so each of those bubble formations creates its own shape, but all of them working together also create a shape. And as a matter of fact, the bubbles working together with the mountain in the background, if you kind of draw a line that encompasses all of these visual elements, it creates this implied triangle shape. And I love the triangle because it's got these converging lines. And whenever you've got lines coming together, that can be a very powerful place in your composition. And so this is also why when I'm doing wide angle landscape photography, I, I actually make an effort by my choice of focal length and my relative position to the foreground to make my foreground bigger than my background because that creates this narrowing of perspective that implies that triangle shape or those converging diagonal lines. And that helps draw the viewer into the scene. And there's also a mirror image of that triangle in the sky formed by the shape of the clouds. And so the two shapes are working together. Of course, there's a bunch of other shapes that are part of this composition, but when I squint my eyes to look at this composition, those are the two overall meta shapes that I see. And so when you're putting these shapes together, you need to think of the world around you, your scene and subject as a visual puzzle. And your job is to just assemble the puzzle pieces in a way that is compelling and that will be effective to the viewer. And so I think of this puzzle analogy in several ways. Uh, you know, one way is I'm trying to get the pieces to work together. But another way I think about it is I, I want the shapes to fit within one another. So each puzzle piece has got its own shape and you need to find uh, another puzzle piece that has sort of like the negative shape of that. You know, so one shape nests within the other, they snap together. And so I'm often looking for ways to frame shapes with other shapes or to nest a shape within another shape. And that's something that's very important, trying to find a way to, to have the shapes kind of fit into specific parts of the composition. So for this drone photo I made in Norway, um, I had this island down below covered in snow. And I was very careful to choose a position for my drone that nested that shape within the waters of the fjord. Like I, I wanted to make sure that that shape didn't touch or overlap with the mountains or the reflections of the mountains in the water. So nesting that shape within that space, that empty space that's surrounded by the shapes of the mountains and the reflection of the mountains was crucial to making this composition work. So it's fitting the puzzle pieces together. Here's another example, another drone photo I recently took in the desert of Utah. And there was sunrise light hitting this desert formation and I flew my drone in position to get the shadow of the formation in the background. And I was very careful to choose a position where the shape of the formation was nested within the shape of the shadow. So the shadow frames the object itself. And so that's just one way of thinking about putting the shapes together is finding a way to nest the shapes or frame the shapes. And when you're doing that, it's very important to achieve visual separation. And so separation is really important in two-dimensional art because we live in a three-dimensional world. Our eyes perceive the world in three dimensions, but when we take a photograph or we make a painting, we're, we're taking that 3D world and squishing it down to this two-dimensional static rectangle. And objects that are obviously separate to us in 3D vision, they can appear to visually merge in two dimensions. And this is most commonly illustrated by the dreaded tree growing out of the head problem. Whenever you take a photo of someone outside, you probably learned early on, you wanna make sure that there's not a tree right behind them. 
because when you take the photo, even though your three-dimensional vision knows that the tree is separate from the person's head, when you squish the world down to two dimensions, it looks like the tree is growing out of their head. And that's a big no-no for outdoor portrait photography. And so this is something that you have to train yourself to do because we naturally perceive everything in three dimensions. So we just don't notice the visual overlap, but it becomes very, very clear when we look at our final photographs and you realize you've screwed up because you have brought two images together that need to be separate because they just appear to visually merge. And there's actually three different ways to look at this. Um, I should say, I should start out by saying that nothing is necessarily bad or wrong. There aren't really any rules or anything like that. There's only some tools and some ways of approaching things. So when we think about visual separation, we can think of three basic strategies. One, is physical separation, making sure that objects aren't touching each other, that they appear distinct. Like with this photo of a white pelican uh, swallowing a fish, you know, they, they grab the fish and then they have to position it a specific way so they can swallow it without damaging their throat. And so they toss the fish around. And so having the fish physically separated from the beak was very critical. Any shot where the fish was overlapping with the beak would have made the photo less effective. So separation, achieving visual separation is usually what we're going for as photographers. But uh, another powerful thing is convergence. When objects are coming together and they visually converge or are very close to converging, those converging elements create a very powerful point in the composition, a strong focal point for the viewer. And I mentioned this earlier when I talked about uh, diagonal lines that converge. That's the same idea. Wherever you've got that convergence, it can be very powerful. So actually intentionally bringing objects together and eliminating that visual separation, like I did here with this photo of two zebra coming down to a water hole at the same time in Namibia, that creates a compelling visual design. And then finally, there's visual overlap, using visual overlap intentionally. When objects overlap in two-dimensional space, they seem to visually merge, or the way we perceive them is we perceive them as a clump of objects or a single object. Uh, that's why we see the tree behind the person and we think it's growing out of their head. We just sort of visually combine them. And so we tend to avoid overlap most of the time, but you can also use it to your advantage because the overlapping objects might create a compelling shape. So these king penguins in the Falkland Islands, they all overlap and together they create this diagonal line that is a useful compositional element for this photograph. And so, you know, the classic example of overlap is when you're photographing a forest and you're looking for a pattern of trees, if you stand in the wrong place, the trees all kind of clump up and don't look very good. But if you move around, you can sometimes find a position where the trees separate more or less and you see this beautiful pattern emerging. I don't actually have many photographs of living forests. So the only real photograph I had that illustrates this is of a dead forest in Namibia. That's a big orange sand dune behind the trees. And so for this clump of trees, I had to walk around to find a position where they were spaced out. Like there's some overlap. There's the three trees in the lower left that are overlapping, for example. So sometimes it's not possible to completely eliminate overlap, but you wanna space things out as much as you can to create a pattern. And remember what I said earlier about how you can change the shape of an object based on your position relative to the object. You can also change its scale. So scale is part of the shape, I guess, when you think of it. And so for this particular photograph, the one tree in the middle, it looks a lot bigger than all the other trees. It wasn't, it was the same size. Uh, it's just that it was a lot closer to me than the trees that were farther back. So it looks a lot bigger. And so I took advantage of that. I made the very prominent V shape formed by that tree as the, uh, as the general structure of my composition. I kind of built the composition around that. And then I just needed to select the right position to, to spread out the pattern of the background trees as much as possible. So eliminating any of that overlap. Uh, but there's a little bit of convergence going on. So for example, there's that tree on the right that's pointing up and there's a branch coming down from the main middle tree. 
And those two branches are pointing towards each other. So there's a bit of a convergence there. And that's going to draw the viewer's eye to that point. Now, um, Kevin may remember this from Antarctica. Um, there was a Weddell seal that was sleeping and a bunch of photographers went by to photograph it. And every now and then it would kind of put its head up and look around, see what was going on, wondering, you know, what all these weird uh, orange colored, uh, you know, uh, penguins were doing, you know, staring at it. And uh, we we were all wearing orange jackets. Sorry, just to clarify. <laughs> um, and uh, when I made this photo, I was very careful to choose a position where the seal's head wouldn't overlap with the rocks in the background because the rocks were kind of the same coloration and texture as the seal. And so I knew if the head came up into the rocks, then I would lose that visual separation. It would be harder to see the main subject. So I noticed that there was some uh, snow that was coming down one of the rocks. Uh, and so I selected a position so that when the seal brought its head up, it would come up into that space. So it was surrounded by white and not overlapping with the rocks. And it's a little thing. It's a small detail. But sometimes these very small details can be the difference between an unsuccessful and a successful composition. And so I built the rest of the composition around this, but that was my critical thing. And so when I'm making photos, I'm always thinking very carefully about these overlaps. Um, you know, even the smallest little overlaps uh, might diminish the effect of the composition. So I'm very careful to be constantly policing for those. And also I do edge patrol. I make sure that there isn't something distracting coming in from the edges of the image frame. You gotta do this a lot when you're working with wider angles like I tend to do. And so you just have to be very careful and uh, and you have to be very nitpicky when you're making these compositions to get everything right. But once you've trained yourself to do it, it becomes intuitive, it's pretty easy. And so visual separation can come from physical separation of objects, but you can also achieve visual separation by changes in the light or in color. And so I like working with strong light because it creates shadows and those shadows can create shapes by visually separating parts of the scene. And so this is a uh, sand dune in Death Valley. I photographed this during a, a wicked sandstorm on PhotoMasters should definitely try to find my, my uh, sandstone video or my sandstorm video adventure, me and another photographer, friend of mine uh, who was with Kevin and I in Antarctica, Joseph Roybal, great guy. We went into the sand dunes of Death Valley during this horrible sandstorm to make photos. And we did a video of our experience. It was a lot of fun. Uh, and once you've photographed a sand dune field in a sandstorm, you're never gonna go back to photographing the sand dunes without any wind. It's, it's just an amazing experience. The dunes seem to come to life. And I made this photo with all the blowing sand in the air. And there was this uh, colorful angled light at sunset. And that angled light was revealing these alternating layers of shadow and light. And so the shadow and light separates the shapes. It creates the shapes. Without that angled light, if there had been flat light on the dunes, you wouldn't have been able to easily differentiate one dune from another. It would have all kind of merged together, but the shadows separate all of that. And it creates this visual progression, this layering in the composition that goes from foreground to background. And here's a photo I took in Iceland during one of the eruptions of the volcano that's erupting near Reykjavik. And I flew over the volcano with my drone. And for this particular eruption, what would happen is the volcano would erupt for a few minutes and then it would stop erupting for a few minutes and then start over again. And while the eruption ceased, you could fly your drone over the crater and look down at the lava pool as that pressure was building back up getting ready for the next release. And so I made this photo. Uh, I was really fascinated by the fractal pattern in the lava pool and the shape of the crater itself with the lava from the last eruption, it's just sort of like rolling back down into the crater. Kind of has this, this eye-like shape. And so I experimented with this for a while and I was very careful to choose the timing for this photograph. I waited until the sunset and things went into twilight. I wanted to bring in that blue light from twilight onto the landscape because I knew that that 
color would be the opposite of the warm colors of the magma. And that would enhance the visual separation. So the differences in color here are really how you define the shapes. Um, if there hadn't been that color difference, um, for example, if the lava had been completely over everything and all you could see was red, uh, I would have lost that, that curving eye shape. So that hint of blue on the landscape around the lava helps define that shape. So color contrast can be very important for visual separation. And so this is an example of both color and luminosity contrast, photographing orangutans in Sumatra of Indonesia, and the mother and her infant were swinging by in a vine. And um, I used just a little hint of fill light, just a very soft amount, just to help separate the orangutans from that dark rainforest background. Uh, if they had been as dark as the rainforest, they probably would have gotten a bit lost there. And so having them be just a little bit brighter makes them separate, but also that that bit of fill flash helps bring out the orange color of the fur. And that creates a really nice color contrast with the greens in the background. So that just helps enhance the visual separation. And here's another example, Grand Tetons in Wyoming. It was a stunning sunrise. Uh, there was fog down below the mountains and the stormy sky above and all this beautiful golden light coming in at sunrise. And anything that was in the shade, like the fog or the bottom of the cloud or the very top of the mountain or the bottom of the mountain, kind of goes this cooler tone, this bluer tone, while anything in the light is getting that warm light of sunrise. So that's creating these alternating layers of shadow and light and alternating bands of blue and yellow. And so all those different shapes, those layers are created by the contrast of light and color. So most of what I've talked about has been about visual separation, but I did mention earlier that visual overlap can be an effective tool. I uh, made these photographs of mountain gorillas when I was in Uganda. I've actually been lucky enough to visit mountain gorillas in all three of the countries where you can find them, Rwanda, Uganda, and the Congo. So I've done the, uh, the triple crown of mountain gorilla photography. And for this scene of a silverback with his family, I initially was trying to find a position where I would make all of the gorillas separate out. I wanted to create that visual separation, but then I realized if I did the opposite, if I went for visual overlap, I could create a more compelling visual design. So I intentionally chose a position. I shifted left and right until I found a position where I got that overlap because the gorillas working together create this really strong curving shape. And that helps guide the viewer through all of the composition. So I chose the visual overlap there specifically as the tool that I needed to make this composition more interesting. And so I've talked about visual progression, leading the eye through the composition. You know, with landscape photography, we think of a foreground leading to maybe a middle ground to a background in the composition. We're often thinking in terms of bottom to top in a composition as well when we're thinking of the visual progression, but it doesn't have to be that way all the time. And the idea of creating this visual progression is, you know, kind of thinking of your composition as a layer. So there's multiple layers, or there might be different visual elements that progressively get the eye moving throughout the composition. One visual element hands the viewer off to the next. You know, you can think of them like building stepping stones into your compositions or a path that leads the eye in. And so I'm always thinking about ways to build this visual progression in my compositions, no matter whether I'm using a wide angle or a telephoto lens or anything in between, no matter what my subject is. And so the idea behind this, uh, as, I, as I tried to like figure out what the visual effect was that I was aiming for here, became the title of my ebook on composition that I wrote many years ago called Visual Flow. And the idea of visual flow is that when you're making a composition, you should imagine yourself standing in a river and you're looking downstream and the water's flowing around you and you're watching the water flow. And the water might hit a boulder and go over it. There might be an eddy swirl here or there where the water gets trapped for a moment, but inevitably, inexorably, the water goes downstream. Gravity has this irresistible pull and the water always flows down. And so you wanna create that same effect with your photographs, with your compositions. You wanna create a composition that pulls the viewer in and doesn't let go, that irresistibly holds them within your composition. 
And so this photo is a, is a very literal example of this concept of visual flow. I was standing in a river making this wide angle composition and I got close to this big boulder in the stream and I made it my foreground. And you can see how all the shapes in the composition sort of pull the eye from that foreground into the background of the composition. So all of the flow of the water, uh, you can see creates these curves and these lines that, that just pull the viewer farther in. Uh, the lines on the edge of the stream, even some of the lines of the tree trunks that are arcing over the river, all of these lines point the viewer to this background spot. Now, the only difference between composition and this river analogy is that a good composition should have a way of pulling the viewer back to the beginning. Um, you know, anything that flows downstream is gone. It's going to keep going downstream. You want to send the viewer downstream, but then you want to grab them, yank them, and pull them all the way back to start that journey all over again. And that's why with a lot of my compositions, especially with my landscape compositions, I might have this really big, bold foreground element. That's part of the reason why I make it big. Like I got close enough to this boulder to make it very strong and prominent and graphic within the composition. And I do that because that's the visual anchor. That's where the viewer starts, but that also is where you wanna pull the viewer back after other elements in the composition draw them deeper in. So having that big foreground is your way of starting them all over. And when they're repeating that process over and over again, that's when they're visually trapped in the composition. That's when a composition is gonna hold their interest over time. So I'm always looking for that push-pull effect. And you can see a lot of my landscape compositions, I'm looking for visual elements that will create that progression leading in. So here it was the ripples in the sand um, at sunset on the Olympic coast of Washington state. And all those ripples are creating these diagonal lines, pushing the eye to that point of interest in the background, that sea stack. And of course you've got other lines created by the horizon, created by the clouds. They're all working together to push the eye farther into the composition. And so a lot of times, as I said, that progression is bottom to top, uh, foreground to background, but it doesn't always have to be. For this photograph of a lion in Kenya that I took at twilight uh, and used a spotlight to illuminate the lion, um, the visual progression is different. So I had two primary visual elements here. I had the spotlight framing the lion, and then I've got this gap in the clouds in the twilight sky, which looks a lot to me like the bat signal. But I was uh, photographing with a friend who's from Canada and he thought it looked more like a maple leaf. So I guess different cultures will interpret things different ways. Uh, in any event, the uh, edges of the bat signal on the left and the right are creating these diagonal lines that are, or I should say implied diagonal lines that are pushing the viewer to the lion down below. So this is a, a top to bottom visual progression. Your visual progression can also come in from the left or the right. It doesn't always have to come in from the bottom. It's just much more common in most compositions where we have this sort of bottom to top visual progression. And you can see there's different layers here in this scene from the Utah desert formed by the shadow and the light and the ridges of the desert features and also the, the layering in the clouds. So all these things working together are creating these distinct layers one layer after another, just bringing the viewer deeper into the scene. And here's a, a scene from Death Valley. Uh, one of those wicked sandstorms is down below and there was this very big thunderstorm up above and I was on the road looking down right after it had, it rained. So the, the water was still on the road, making it reflective, making it more luminous. And so instead of just zooming in and photographing the wild scene that was going on down below, I stepped into the road and used that to create that visual progression. The lines of the road uh, become these diagonal lines that lead the viewer deeper into the scene. So a lot of times when I'm making compositions, what I'm doing is I'm zooming out some from my main subject. I'm not just photographing the main subject. I'm taking a wider view, bringing in more visual elements to enhance the visual complexity and to make the overall visual design more compelling for the viewer. And here's a scene from the south shore of Lake Superior, one of those ice caves, but this time in the summer when it's just a cave. 
And you can see how I used all the striations in the sandstone as leading lines as these, this, this, this wild array of diagonal lines coming together, this visual vortex that pulls the viewer in. And here, once again, your position can change the shape of objects. All these striations in the sandstone are parallel lines, but with a wide angle lens and with perspective distortion, because I was really close to the walls on one side of the sandstone cave, excuse me for a moment, <laughs> that makes those parts look bigger. And so it turns those vertical lines into these stretched out diagonal lines. And uh, that just creates this dizzying array of visual interest, creating this progression from the edges and the corners of the image into the center of the composition. And uh, here's an example from Patagonia down in Chile. And I had this really beautiful, massive storm building up over the mountains in the distance. So I went wide to bring in that entire shape of the cloud. And I noticed I had this curving shape coming down. So I needed a shape to complement that, to create this visual connection, this visual progression. And so I didn't really have anything interesting going on with these black rocks on the shore. So I waited for a wave to come in and the half second exposure blurred the wave and that creates a complementary shape. And if you connect those two shapes, you can see that they really form an S curve that leads the viewer throughout the composition. And so this is a, you know, a good example of, of how your subject isn't your subject. You know, people go down there to photograph the mountains. In this composition, the mountains are, are pretty small. They are just the cherry on top. Uh, the composition itself is everything else besides the mountain. What makes this composition work is the wave and the clouds, all the other stuff other than the scenery. The scenery is just a small part of the overall composition. Okay, um, I'll just pause for a minute. Kevin, have any questions come in or anything that we need to address? Uh, there are a few questions. Um, Holger, are you there that you can read those off? Yeah, I'm here. Okay. Uh, Suzanne was saying Ian uses fill flash quite a bit to create real impact. Could he speak a bit of his flash technique and equipment? Um, yeah, I you know I'll use fill flash with some wildlife subjects. Uh, the key thing, I mean, flash is actually not too difficult to use in a wildlife setting. Um, you, you you can't really be elaborate with it like you are in the studio. So you're you've got on camera flash. And what I do is I use a flash bracket just to get the, the flash as much off the camera as possible. But, you know, it's it's usually just a few inches away from the camera. Uh, the key thing for me, though, is I always use it at low power. You know, so my flash compensation might be set to minus two or minus three with most of my subjects. Uh, and I do that because, one, I don't want to have that obvious flash look. I just want to have some soft fill light so that the subject either balances with the ambient light or maybe it's just a little bit brighter than the ambient light. And also I don't want to disturb my subject. Um, and so you got to be careful with wildlife. Uh, you don't want to disturb them generally. Uh, and flash is a problem if you're shooting specific types of wildlife. Like for example, you don't want to photograph hunting owls or bats at night using flash because that will mess them up. Um, but you know, most other subjects it's okay they probably won't even notice the flash if it's at low power because it's really not much brighter than the ambient light. And so I keep it at low power just so that it looks more natural and also so I don't disturb my subject so I can keep on making photos. Interesting. Okay. All right, then moving on. I want to talk about a concept called dynamic balance. And so when we think of making compositions. Uh, we can think of uh, basically two extremes. Uh, you want to have visual energy in your photo. But if you've got too much visual energy, that can lead to total chaos. The viewer just doesn't know what's going on. Um, you also want to have balance in your compositions. You don't, you don't want to have these weird unbalanced compositions that don't make any sense to the viewer. But if you've got too much balance, your composition can be really boring. And so what you need to do is strive to find the, some sort of middle ground between these two opposing ideals. And this is something that artists call dynamic balance. So it's a composition that has order, that has some balance, that has some tranquility, but also has visual energy, something that makes it interesting. 
And so I think of this in terms of opposing ideals like order versus chaos, uh, symmetry versus asymmetry, uh, having a pattern versus an anomaly that breaks up the pattern. And so you're trying to find that dynamic balance between these opposites when you're making photographs. And so here's a, here's a good example of this concept of dynamic balance. So if you look at this photo that I took in Joshua Tree National Park and you split it in the middle from left to right, um, the left side and the right side look very similar. Um, most of the primary visual elements are in that middle part of the composition, the boulder in the foreground, the boulder clump in the background, the cloud above the boulders. Um, and so that is giving this composition some balance. It's giving it some order, some tranquility, but it's not completely symmetrical. There are some asymmetries that are built in, some anomalies that break things up. And so one is that boulder coming in from the left. There's, there's really nothing on the right that kind of matches that. But the primary thing that breaks up the symmetry here are these curving lines formed by this intrusion in the rock, some sort of quartz intrusion or something like that. I'm not exactly sure. Those are pushing the eye from left to right. And so they're breaking up that symmetry. They're, they're messing with that order. They're diminishing the tranquility. They're adding some visual energy. So this is a balanced composition. It's pleasing, but it's still interesting to look at. And here's another example taken in the Utah desert. And this is even more symmetrical. Left to right looks very symmetrical. Top to bottom actually looks very symmetrical because the diagonal lines formed by that light on the underside of the clouds um, matches, mirrors very much the diagonal lines of the erosion patterns in the foreground. And of course I chose those erosion patterns because of the texture in the sky. I wanted something to mirror that shape. So there's a lot of symmetry in this image, but it's also very energetic. All of those diagonal lines everywhere are moving in different directions, get the eye moving around. So this achieves that purpose of dynamic balance. We have both energy and tranquility in this composition. It's pleasing to look at, but it's also fun to look at. And this is, uh, you know, once again, aiming for dynamic balance, but you don't always have to find that same middle ground between energy and balance in your compositions. You can skew more one way or the other. You just want to avoid pushing things to either extreme. And so this is a scene from the desert in Nevada. Went very wide when this storm came in at sunrise. So I've got the sunrise light on the background and also the angled light on the sandstone fins in the foreground. And so the shadows and the light on the sandstone fins are creating a bunch of these lines and curves. And those lines and curves are really sort of pushing the eye over to the left side of the composition. But then there's a bunch of shapes that the eye encounters that are pushing the eye back towards the right side of the composition. And so you can see all these shapes coming together. Uh, at the very end, they all push the eye into that central part of the composition, but they do so first by spiraling around. So there's a lot of visual energy, but you're still ending up in that middle part of the composition, which is providing some balance and some order in the composition. And so you can just see that spiraling effect that results. And this composition seemingly pushes things more into the realm of visual energy. So I, I'm dealing with two opposites here. So this was a, a night drive I was doing in Africa and uh, the driver found a, a lion with her cubs and shone the spotlight on her. And I went wide because there was this uh, cloudy sky that was backlit by the full moon. And so there was this one bright part of the clouds where the moon was. And I wanted to incorporate that as a visual element. And these two visual elements working together are in this opposing diagonal relationship, which is very energetic. It, diagonal lines have a lot of visual energy and I, I try to use them as much as possible in my compositions. They're just much more energetic than horizontal or vertical lines. A horizontal line goes from left to right. A vertical line will take the viewer from bottom to top or vice versa, but a diagonal line will take the viewer from left to right and bottom to top. So it'll do both. And so it's a bit more energetic. Um, but it's still balanced. You've got the moonlit clouds in the upper left and you've got the, okay. the circle of the spotlight around the lines in the lower right. And so those two visual elements are actually balancing one another, creating some symmetry across that diagonal axis. 
And so you could just see me doing different things with these photos, like this penguin in Antarctica. Um, you know, the penguin was standing on this hill, so it had this kind of funny angle. Uh, and you've got a lot of lines that are pushing from the penguin out. So the line of the shadow, its beak, its uh, one flipper on the left. There's a bit of a line of snow behind it. All of those lines are pushing the eye to the lower left. So I put the penguin in the upper right to bring the eye back to that area to start all over again. So the lines are moving one way away from the penguin. The penguin is a strong enough, bold enough shape. It's got a nice curve to it also, by the way, that that brings the eye back and starts it all over again. So there's a lot of visual opposition going on here. And same thing here, you know, this is a shot from Badlands National Park, beautiful storm at sunrise. There's a bunch of erosion lines in the foreground that are pushing from lower left to the right of the composition. Uh, the clouds are pushing more towards the upper left. So you've got visual interest in the lower right and then in the upper left, and that's creating that visual counterpoint, that diagonal visual relationship between the two, getting the eye bounced back and forth. When you have leading lines, you can have them lead towards your main subject or you can have them lead away from a strong subject. Either way can work very effectively. Um, and so if they lead away from a subject, as long as that subject is still strong somewhere else, it creates that visual tug of war. And so here are two examples of the same subject, two polar bears fighting in a blizzard. And for this, I opted for almost perfectly symmetrical composition, at least from left to right. And so it's a, it's a bit more placid, a bit more tranquil. For this composition, uh, I had a different angle. And so this is a much more dynamic angle. So the first has got more balance. The second has more energy, but they both still have some of the opposite qualities. I just chose a middle point between those opposites that was skewed more one way or the other for each shot. So they're both effective, but they have different visual results. And uh, here's the volcano in Iceland. And I'm always thinking about the visual arrangements, how everything's gonna come together. And so I saw the line of lava coming from the volcano. So instead of just zooming in on the volcano, I took a wider view because I wanted to bring in that zigzag. I knew that would be an energetic shape. A zigzag is just a bunch of diagonal lines, gets the eye moving in all sorts of directions. Um, but then I had two, so there's a lot of energy because of that zigzag, but then I had two primary visual elements that are opposite of each other that give this composition some balance. So I've got the sun in the upper left, and then to balance it is the plume of steam in the lower right. So those two objects are opposite each other, uh, but in a very balanced way. And so for this shot taken in Namibia, I had this visual progression of these salt marshes, the patterns formed by the salt marshes. And I shot this in silhouette at sunset with their bright, colorful light hitting the water. And so I'm using all the techniques we've talked about. I'm you know, thinking about this in terms of artistic abstraction. I'm using that visual progression. I was careful to also have some visual separation. So I, I wanted to have one flamingo be the focal point of this composition. So I had to wait for one to break the pattern to be an anomaly so it would stand out more. And so I was just waiting for one of the uh, the pelicans to, sorry, flamingo. I was waiting for one of the flamingos to lift its head so it would stand out. And I had to wait for the right one to lift its head <laughs> because the wrong one just wasn't balancing the composition right. And if you think of the visual flow of this composition, to me at least, that progression starts on the lower left. And each clump of salt marsh passes the eye onto the next. And that progression is mostly going from the lower left to the upper right. And so if you kind of squint and imagine an implied line going from the lower left to the upper right, it points directly towards that one flamingo that's got its head up. So I was intentionally waiting for that flamingo and only that flamingo to have its head up. It probably took me about a half an hour until I got it just right. So that is the focal point that ties the entire composition together using all these techniques. And just, um, I wanted to say something about centered compositions. I think there is a lot of photo composition rules mythology out there that says that the center is a bad place. You should never put anything in the middle of your composition. This is very much wrong. Uh, it comes from a good place. 
because I think the tendency of most beginners is just to point their camera at their main subject and put it right in the middle. And that can lead to what I was talking about earlier. It can create a very balanced symmetrical composition, but one that lacks any visual interest or visual energy. And so things like the rule of thirds are designed to get the subject away from the center. But I think these are actually bad rules because they, they're just too simplistic. And I also think that the center can be a very powerful place in your composition. And you'll notice a lot of my compositions have got some element of centering going on. The key thing with a centered composition is to have visual interest elsewhere to get that visual energy that you want to create that dynamic balance. And so this is a good example, a uh, shot I recently took in the desert of Arizona. The sun star is coming up right in the middle of the composition, at least from left to right. Uh, and the choya in the foreground is also occupying that same space in the middle from left to right of the composition. Uh, there's not much about this composition that's that's away from that that center axis, but there's still a lot of visual energy. So that that centering gives it that balance. Uh, but everything else that's going on that pulls the eye away from the center, like the diagonal lines formed by the sun star or the shadows coming out or the bright bits of choya in the lower left and the lower right that kind of grab the viewer's attention. All these things get the eye away from the center and make this a much more dynamic composition. So don't fear the center, embrace the center. I think it'll allow you to make much more powerful photographs. So final thoughts. These are just a few of my favorite techniques. I can talk about composition for hours, days, weeks, months, years, decades, centuries. It's, it's a never ending learning process. Um, even for me, someone who's been talking and teaching composition for many, many years now, I'm still <laughs> unlocking new ways of seeing. And none of these are ironclad rules. These are all just tools that you should use as needed. And I think the clearest example of that was when we talked about visual separation. And I said, look, this isn't something you always have to do. You can also do the opposite. You can choose to use visual overlap as a tool instead. So there are no rules of composition. There are only tools that you can use. And the trick is learning when to use them and when not to use them. And I like to say that when you point your camera at something and just trigger the shutter, when you take a snapshot, you're just showing the world what your camera sees. But when you take the time to make an artistic composition, you show the world what you see. You share your artistic vision, translate your experience for the viewer. And then finally, if you can see it, you can do it. Composition can be very difficult to master. And sometimes it can be very difficult to understand. But if you are watching a presentation on composition and someone says something about it and you say, oh, I get it. I, I see what he or she is talking about. Or if you're looking at a photograph or a painting that you like and you're like, oh, I see what the artist did here. I can see how they use the compositional shapes. If you can see that, it may take some practice, but nothing will stop you from implementing that technique yourself when you're making photographs. So if you can see it, you can definitely do it. And uh, every photograph should say as much about you as an artist as it does about, this, about the subject. So always remember that when you're making photos. This is your way of telling your story as an artist. And definitely check out photomasters.com, my photo education website, to learn more. Check out my free photography webinar using the link I put in the chat. And visit me at ianplant.com to see more of my photographs. And thank you very much, everyone, Ian, for patiently was, listening. Wow. Uh, it's always exciting to see the, your, your images. And uh, gosh, it just, you, I, I asked a question, so I'll save Holger from um, asking it. From yeah, the yeah, I got it. And then um, uh, Holger um, has a number of questions, I think, that have come yeah. in here that, that we'd love to see if you can answer. But you use a wide angle for a lot of these, don't you? Oh, yeah, definitely. And, and your favorite vocal length range is? Uh, well, to give you a hint, when uh, when I talk about 17 millimeters on a full frame camera, I think that's a telephoto lens. So <laughs> my uh, my my current <coughs> reigning wide angle lens is uh, 12 to 24. I also have a nine millimeter uh, that's not a fisheye. It's just mm. a, a full frame rectilinear lens. And that's about as wide as you can go 
uh, you go any wider and you, it's impossible to keep your feet out of the composition. So mm -hmm. I, what I like about wide angle is that it, it allows you to manipulate the scale and the shape of objects in, in ways that longer focal lengths just can't do. So when you're working with a wide angle lens, it reduces everything to a smaller size. And then you get closer to an object to make it bigger. And getting closer can also change its shape as well. And so I love how you can use the wide angle to subvert expectations and to very playfully show the world in a way that the human eye never experiences it. And so that's what I love about wide angles. Um, wide angles can be a little difficult to, to learn. They're counterintuitive because everything gets so small. And so you really have to train yourself to learn to get closer to your subjects, sometimes very, very close. And we think of when we think of like intimate photography, like intimate landscape photography, you most people think of long lenses. You're using longer focal lengths to zoom in on some discrete feature. But I think wide angle photography is the most intimate photography there is because you have to really immerse yourself in the scene or subject you're photographing. You've got to get really, really close to it. And there's nothing more intimate than that. So that's why I love wide angle. Well, it's it's really refreshing to, to, to see and it changes a lot of what, as a landscape photographer, as you were saying, um, that we're accustomed to doing. Um, mm -hmm. I, I look, I look forward to heading to the Faroe Islands and, you know, just throwing that wide angle on and and working it uh, a little bit differently than I've done uh, with things in the past. One last question in regards to that, though, you you've got mm -hmm. such depth of field. Are you bracketing, focus bracketing, or are you relying on the depth of field from yeah. lower uh, and smaller f stops? Um, you know, these days for my landscape work, I'm doing focus stacking. You know, back in the old days, I did the uh, hyperfocal distance, yep. small f-stop thing. Uh, focus stacking really just sort of replicates that, but it, it takes all the guesswork out of it and you end up with sharper images overall. Uh, and it does allow you to push the extremes a bit more because uh, the only way to, to, like, there's a limit to how much depth the field can bring in if you have a really extreme perspective. And, and back in the old days, Kevin, you probably... Remember the, uh, the the large format film days, uh, you know, where we used to have uh, movements uh, at the uh, the focal and the lens plane yeah. um, of the camera that would allow you to you know tilt and uh, do other things to extend your your uh, your focus range, um, your depth of field, and that's by and large disappeared. So the only way you can easily do that really extreme perspective photography nowadays is to do focus stacking. So I do it as much as I can. I think it's it, it does make everything a lot easier. It's really simple to do. You just, you know, sure. most images, it's like a three uh, shot focus bracket, focus on the near, middle, far, and then just use a focus stacking program to bring them together. But I also think it's a really good idea for everyone to know how to do it the old fashioned way. Uh, because there are times when you can't focus stack. The light's changing yeah. too fast, or you've got a you know subject that's moving around and the focus stack blending is gonna be difficult. So knowing how to do it the old fashioned hyperfocal distance way is also very helpful. Well, some of the shots you do, you, you know, with a wide angle, you you stand the chance of having, you know, exaggerated perspective if you're focusing there. Are you making perspective changes uh, in post processing so you don't have a lot of the keystoning and other uh, things that accompany not having a wide angle lens level? Like you said, shooting yeah. with a wide angle is a lot different and kind of tricky. Yeah, yeah, you you know, perspective distortion is definitely an issue. So you know, I'm not shooting architecture. Um, and so that's that's an area where that perspective distortion causing the keystone and could be really problematic for you. Um, you know, when you're shooting irregular landscape features, that's not necessarily an issue. And so I usually I embrace the perspective distortion. So the most common time I see it in my landscape work is when I'm in a forest, and I get those leaning trees. Sure. Uh, but I, I love it. Those I love having those trees lean because they become diagonal lines and it can be a bit more dynamic. So I usually just sort of lean into the perspective distortion. But for very specific genres, that perspective distortion can be problematic. And um, there's not much you can do. Like you can either make sure that your camera's perfectly level when you're taking the photo to avoid that perspective distortion. Uh, you can fix it in post, but you do that by stretching the image and doing major cropping. And so you lose a lot of the real estate. So if if you want to do wide angle work, but you're doing it with a subject 
where you need those straight lines, like if you're doing architecture, probably a good idea to go out and get one of those specialty tilt shift lenses yep. that allows you to avoid that perspective distortion, that keystoning effect. Cool. Well, I'm going to let Holger uh, go through some of the questions that have come in on chat, and then we'll wrap it yeah. up after um, there's some good questions in here. So Holger. Right. So Suzanne asks, uh, Ian, you're such a great word weaver. Uh, do you find titles for your images a simple or a complex task? What uh, are your is your process for creating titles, and wo what uh, do you want to convey with them? <laughs> I, that, that's a great <laughs> question. I was actually talking with someone about this the other day. I used to come up with titles for each and every one of the images that was in my online portfolio. And after you've done this a few hundred times, you sort of run out of good titles and good ideas. So I stopped doing it. So now none of my photos have titles. Um, I, I always thought that giving titles to the photos was fun. But on the other hand, I kind of feel like, you know, the, the image should speak for itself. Um, so I think it's okay to do it either way. Uh, but I, I ended up just, you know, doing a lot of obscure literary references and stuff like that. So it was always fun giving you know, giving one of my images a title from some book that I read years ago that I loved that no one else reads. And then every now and then I'd get an email from someone saying, oh yeah, that was an awesome reference to that one book. Uh, <laughs> but it was just too much work. So I gave up on it. <laughs> okay. uh, Jeff has actually three questions. Uh, Zoom or primes, handheld or tripod, is it better to be good or lucky? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, the first two are, are very easy. Uh, I shoot primarily with zooms. I love the flexibility of zooms. Uh, primes can be very, very great, um, but they are limiting. Um, you can't very easily change your composition with a prime. With a zoom, it's it's much easier. And most zooms today are, are very good optical quality. You're not really losing much. Unless you're doing a, a specialty type of photography, like portrait photography, you might want to have a specific prime that's optimized for that. Other than that, zooms are great. Um, for my landscape work, it's almost always on a tripod because uh, a lot of times I'm shooting in low light, magic hours, twilight. And so I need the depth of field. I have to stop down. I'm doing the focus stacking. I also like working with a tripod because of the precision you get with your composition. Once you get it perfectly set up, you're not going to lose it. Um, if you're hand holding, you know, as you move around, you might lose that perfect position. With wildlife, uh, almost always handheld because it, it's just so much more spontaneous. Um, so it's a much different approach. Same thing with a lot of my travel photography and other types of photography I do. The final question, whether it's better to be good or lucky, um, both, because photography is essentially the exercise of waiting for luck. And so to be good as a photographer, you have to be lucky, or at least you have to be patient enough to wait for luck. Because you know, when you're working in a studio, you can control everything, where everything is. But when you're working in the real world, when you're not in a studio, you're at the mercy of the elements. Um, you know, even like with landscape photography, I might choose that perfect position to line up my composition, but I'm still at the mercy of the light and the shadows. And I'm also at the mercy of the clouds. I can't control the clouds. I can control the landscape. I can choose that perfect position. Um, but I can't control the clouds and the clouds are going to bring those additional shapes. And so really effective photography, whether you're doing landscape or you're doing street photography like Cartier-Bresson is waiting for those lucky convergences where these random visual elements come together for a brief moment, converge to form a pleasing composition. And that's the moment you trigger the shutter. And that is part of the process of composition that I didn't really talk about. Like, you know, when you're creating a composition, you can control your position, where you are, your perspective. You can control your focal length, deciding how much or how little of the scene you want to come in. And then finally, you control when you trigger the shutter. And so you're waiting for that moment where everything lines up. A lot of my wide angle landscape shots have got clouds forming shapes that interact perfectly with the landscape. That doesn't happen uh, like magic. And I'm not to using Photoshop to make that happen. I'm sitting there patiently waiting. I, I got that perfect scene and I see that cloud coming and I'm waiting for that moment when it's in the perfect position and hoping that it'll get there before the light goes away. So sometimes I have to go back to the same spot over and over and over again before I get that luck. So yes, yes, both. <laughs> okay. 
Uh, then David is asking, do you walk down the street and see in shapes even when you, uh, when you don't have a camera in your hand? Yes, absolutely. And that can be a little dangerous because sometimes I'm crossing the street and I look up and I'm like, oh, look at look at those shapes coming at me. I see these beautiful triangles and, and circles and these lines. Oh, wait, that's a Mack truck that's barreling down on me. So, yes, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's good to train yourself to see this way, but you've also got to learn when to turn it off. <laughs> And the last question is by Stephen. How much post-processing do you normally do? So um, my post-processing processing is actually fairly basic. Um, you know, I'm doing some work in Adobe Camera Raw and Photoshop to, to optimize contrast and color um, and also to uh, subtly, uh, subtly change the relative luminosity values of objects. Like, you know, maybe just giving a little extra brightness to my subject to make it stand out more. Um, but I, I used to shoot color slide film for 10 years before I switched over to digital. And for me, that's what photography is, everything you do before you trigger the shutter. And so I, I really learned how to work with light and color and to learn how to optimize that when I was taking the photos. And so I still bring that tradition into my photography. So I, I'm of the opinion that the digital darkroom is there to uh, optimize the reality you've captured through the photographic process, but that the key thing is to still capture that magic while you're out there making the photos, not create it on the computer later on. Yeah. Okay, that's all I have. Good. All right. Well, uh, can I jump in with a question? Yes, uh, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, do you um, do you take a drone with you all the time, and when and how and where do you decide? Do you decide? to uh to deploy it i uh, that's a great question uh, i use my drone i love my drone i use it so much that it's now my primary camera my my regular camera i now call my land camera and um so i try to use it as much as possible i love it just because it's it's so fast moving between different compositions if you're looking to create really interesting compositions the drone is amazing because it can zip back and forth uh, very quickly, and you can scout on the fly as well. Uh, some places don't allow drones, and so uh, that's my primary consideration when I'm going to a location. I find out whether drones are allowed there or not, and if they're not, I just don't bring it. But usually I've got my drone with me and um, where I can legally fly. It depends on, on what I'm photographing, but a lot of times it's my primary camera, and more and more of my work these days are, is done with a drone. I think it's an amazing creative tool and I use it to the fullest extent whenever I can. Did you get the drone license? Um, so uh, so when you're, it depends on, you know, various country by country. In the U.S., you can get a commercial drone license. Um, I am just shooting freelance with my drone. And so you definitely need to get it if you are doing any work for hire. Um it's a little bit more of a gray area otherwise. Um, so, you know, I'm just doing it as a freelance. I'm not getting paid for any of my drone photos or anything like that. So I've been operating under the uh, the recreational license so far. Good. And yeah. so, I'm sorry. So which drone are you using? And do you find the various um, flight times uh, somewhat limiting sometimes? I am shooting with the Mavic 3 which has got about a 45 minute flight time and also the mini three pro, which has got a half an hour. Um, and uh, sometimes the half an hour flight time is a bit limiting, um, but you can do a lot of amazing work in, in 25, 30 minutes. So sometimes when I'm flying my Mavic three, I've got too much flight time. I get, you know, I get everything I need and I'm like, wow, I still got 20 minutes of flight time. What am I going to do now? So uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, there are some limitations to it, but if you're strategic about when you launch, you know, so usually if I'm like waiting for a sunset shoot, I might do a, a launch early on when the light's just beginning to get good and do some scouting and kind of figure things out. And then I bring the drone back, put in a new battery. So I've got a fresh battery when the light's at its peak and I know exactly where to be. Thank you. Mm -hmm. cool. oh, I, I got a question. Yeah. Ian. Uh, thank you for answering my questions too, by the way, but you said camera raw and Photoshop. You don't use Lightroom. How dare you? No, I don't use Lightroom. Adobe camera raw is identical to Lightroom in terms of image processing. It just doesn't have the 
same pipeline, can, different usability though. Right, 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 right. So uh, all the processing techniques are the same. Um, I just, I mean, I, I grew up before Lightroom. And so when Lightroom came out with all this importing and cataloging, I couldn't stand it. So I just never used it. I just used Bridge, Adobe Camera Raw and Photoshop to organize and edit my photos. Uh, no good reason other than that's the way I've always done it. And I'm well, old Ke enough to- Kev Kevin and I can teach you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, well, now, the, the reason I ask is that uh, um, you look a lot younger than your, um, shall I say, your vision. You, you, uh, you're kind of old school, uh, you know, on the tripod, uh, looking and composing. I appreciate the compositional uh, approach that you take. A, an awful lot of photographers just ignore basic compositional rules and, and wonder why their photographs are not very good. Um, but uh, the other thing that you, so you have you actually used an 8x10 uh, camera? Yes, yeah. I have. Okay. I mean, so yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're older than you lucky. <laughs> that, that is correct. <laughs> I'm oh, older than you. I look and much older than I act. <laughs> you, you age well. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, well, no, I just think that composition, I mean, all other things equal. Uh, mm. The one thing that, that um, well, we didn't even get into AI, but the one thing that uh, the cameras are so good. The mm -hmm. the post processing is so good th that that ultimately it is the composition. It's your final um, frame of the <clears throat> image that you choose, and and you're personally responsible for every single fucking pixel in the photograph. And and yes. I appreciate that because you're you are very. I liked also you said something along the lines of border. Patrol, mm -hmm. yeah. One of the things that I recommend to people that they look at their image at two hundred percent and every single area of the image at two hundred percent and get rid of anything that doesn't help the image. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, you know, I think those are all excellent points, and I think first and foremost that composition is how you engage in the art of photography because you, you're not creating the things that you're photographing. You know, they're either just out there in nature or just, you know, or if you're photographing like a cityscape, it's something that someone else has designed and developed. You're just reacting to the things that you're seeing. So choosing how you react to that, choosing your position, your focal length, what you're including, what you're excluding, the, the, the moment when you trigger the shutter, that is at the core of the photographic process. That's what you bring to the table as a photographer. And yeah, there's, you know, you could also do some stuff in the digital dark room to enhance what you've done. That's part of the process as well. But to me, it is just critical to learn composition and learn how light works. You know, like I, you see on YouTube and articles everywhere, all these tutorials on how to use Photoshop to add a sky that wasn't there. Or, you know, if you don't like your photo, add some fog and, you know, or, you know, buy this equipment to make your photography better. And I'm of the opinion that if you want to take better photos, <laughs> learn how to take better photos. <laughs> and that's yeah. learning composition and learning how to master the use of light. And you do those two things and you'll find you don't really need to spend a lot of time in the digital darkroom. Like people are surprised when they see that I'll often edit an image within five minutes or less because, you know, garbage in, garbage out. If you've got something good coming in, it doesn't take much to optimize that for the final product. Well, your, your images certainly speak for themselves. Um, maybe we can have you back on again sometime. I'd love to yeah. uh, you know, hear how you market your images and how you distribute them. Your work is so beautiful. You know, do you do galleries and printing and so forth like that? But uh, yeah. I must say that you know, now this is the second time I've seen a presentation by you. Um, it's very inspiring and, and and it's very refreshing compared to a lot of the other work that uh, I, I've I've seen. So you know, a tip of the hat again to you. I'm certainly happy that uh, we made our acquaintances in Antarctica. Um, and, um, and the even the other thing I was going to say is that uh, I better to be good or lucky. Um, my father had a thing that uh, the harder you work, the luckier you get. Mm. And 
every indication is that you work really hard and therefore you end up getting lucky. You end up being in the right place at the right time with the right lens, yeah. with the right subject. Uh, and that can be, um, it, it's, it isn't easy, is it? No. no, it isn't. And the way I would put it is that, you know, I, like I said, you're waiting to get lucky, but really as a photographer, you're learning how to manage the luck that you get. You, when, when you learn composition and how to use light and how to be creative, you're, you're learning to make something out of whatever is presented to you. And so you're learning how to, to recognize when that luck happens and to execute it properly. And it takes a lot of practice and experience and, and it doesn't, you know, like the idea that we're just waiting around for something lucky to happen doesn't diminish what we're doing at all. I think in, to the contrary, you know, that's what the core of the photographic art is, is, is waiting for those magical moments when the real world spontaneously aligns to create something that's photogenic. Our job as the photographer is to pluck that slice of reality from the living world and to preserve it forever in the final photograph. And that takes a lot of skill and a lot of practice and a lot of dedication. And I love every minute of it. <laughs> Perfect. Well, if there's not any other questions for Ian, um, we're going to conclude. Nikon, Canon, Fuji, or Sony. Oh, there we go, <laughs> Jeff. <laughs> well, I, I shoot with uh, Sony cameras, uh, though my primary lenses are Tamron. Uh, I work with them as one of their ambassadors. So, Excellent. Are there any other questions out there from anyone at all? Comments? Did you shoot the eclipse? I know I missed this one, but I've, I've got a few in the bag already. So I, I got a real nice shot with my iPhone off of my TV screen on CNN. Oh, cool. <laughs> wow. Was it, did you use your wide angle lens? Yeah? <laughs> no, a telephoto. <laughs> I think right, I well, have look. the same shot, Jeff. <laughs> uh, wait, uh, we have one more question, um, mm -hmm. Ian. Somebody asked, "Do you ever shoot with an iPhone?" Um, <laughs> yeah, on occasion, I'll I'll take it out. Like it, it's great. It's the camera that's always with you. Like, yeah. uh, and so sometimes, like these random things happen, and you're like, "Wow, that would make a great picture." Now you can just take out your phone and take a great picture. Though I don't think any of my iPhone shots. Uh, get used for much of anything, but I do take it with me. I actually use it a lot as a scouting tool when I'm looking for compositions. Um, so I, th I find it very helpful for that. Yeah, I, I love there's... it just because it records on a map exactly where the picture was taken that you can always yeah. come back to later on and so forth. So. Roger's cat likes photography, apparently. <laughs> He's been Excellent. trying okay, to well, get in the way we... this all day. I'm sorry, I might, have, I might have cut you off. Say that again, please. He's been trying to get in the way of this presentation all day. <laughs> so I am just to let you know, check your email. I sent your uh, portraits via WeTransfer. Super. Thank you. Appreciate it. I haven't uh, gotten it yet, but oh, there it is. <laughs> Got it. Thank you. Very, very appreciative, Jeff. All right. All right. Well, Ian, once again, on behalf of all of us and uh, uh, wait a second, big thank you. Ian and Ian. Which is the correct pronunciation? I, either or either. <laughs> They're all, it's all just variations of the name John. So. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, um, we'll put the recording up in the next few days. And uh, Kevin, uh, thank you very much, Holger. Um, I got a, uh, a response from John that, that uh, uh, you know, he'll watch the video later. <laughs> wow. Well. Well, the power failures always seem to be coming during the photo chats, don't they? All right. Well, I'm going to uh, stop the recording at this point. And, thank you, um, everyone. Thanks very much, Ian. Thanks, Ian. Thanks, Ian. Thanks, It's been Kevin. a real pleasure. And thank you, Kevin, for inviting me. It was great meeting you in Antarctica, and I can't wait to uh, continue our collaboration. Take care, guys. Well, definitely for sure. All Bye -bye. right. Take care, Bye. everybody. See you in two weeks. <laughs>